congregation. Welcome once again to another Bone Snapping Edition of the Bone Yard. Grab your Bible, open up application on your phone, open up a web browser, however you follow along in Holy Scripture, because we here at the Bone Yard believe in Sola Scriptura. Now you may be saying, Kevin, are you speaking in tongues? Is that some kind of uh, is that some kind of fraternity at some college? Uh, no, if you said Latin, you would be correct. That's Latin, and it means the scriptures and the scriptures alone. We don't believe the Watchtower, the Book of Mormon, someone's personal revelation or dream trumps holy scripture. That the Christian is under authority of God's holy word. So open your Bible, open up to the Book of James. If you've been following along with us in our series of James, you know we're knee deep in good ritual. James was the half-brother of Jesus who wrote to the churches to all times and all places. See, at the beginning of James, he, he used most epistles having greetings. And James was writing to all the churches and all times. And it still echoes to our churches and our cultures here today in our time as James is talking about some hardcore stuff. He's talking about the testing of our faith. If you remember our last episode, James was talking about it's the testing of your faith that proves that your faith is genuine. Back in the New Testament times, when you go to a flea market or an open market and you were to look at a vessel, you were to hold it up and you were to check out that vessel. Well, some underhanded, scandalous people who sell things sometimes will take broken vessels and melt wax within the cracks of that vessel. When the, the, the desert heat would hit that vessel, it would melt the wax and the vessel would become of no good. So he's, the, the, the people in the New Testament time would hold up the vessel to the sun and rotate it. Check out the vessel and make sure it was usable. Well, that's what James is telling us now, that when we were held to the fire, our faith is shown to be true. Our faith is shown to be genuine. Now, James tells us if we don't understand this, what should we do? So open your Bible and look at James chapter 1. Look at James chapter 1, a testing of our faith. And we pick up at verse number 5. James says, if you like wisdom... If you like understanding, if you don't know what he's talking about, when he's talking about the testing of your faith proves your faith. See, there are those whenever they hear a preacher say, come to Jesus and life will be easy. Come to Jesus and life will be a bag of Skittles. Oh, come to Jesus and everything will be better. I don't know about you, congregation, but when I came to Jesus, my life actually got harder. Oh, when I came to Jesus, it was even a more struggle because I was aware of my depravity. I was aware of my need for a Savior. I was aware how wicked I am, and I had to deal with life's issues. So don't come to Jesus for a better golf swing. Don't come to Jesus to get your house paid off. Oh, don't come to Jesus to give a perfect hair and, and never have morning breath. No, no, no. Come to Jesus because you're depraved. Come to Jesus because you'll stand before God. It's appointed for man once to die, and then you'll stand before God on judgment day. Come to Jesus because you, you need a Savior. Now, James says, if you lack wisdom, if you don't understand well, what all this is about, what should you do? See, this is the Proverbs of the New Testament. We use these verses, then and we can apply them. They're, they're very applicable. Then we can apply them to our lives. James says, if you lack wisdom, let him ask God. He doesn't say ask Oprah. <laughs> no. He doesn't say ask Dr. Phil. He doesn't say turn in your help, self-help books. He doesn't say help yourself and look to yourself. He doesn't say meditate. Look inwardly. Look into yourself to be the better you. He doesn't say any of those things. He says if you lack wisdom, if you lack understanding, if you lack understanding what all this means, let him ask God. And look how he describes God. Look how James the leader in the church of Jerusalem. Look how he describes God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given unto him. If you don't understand, ask God. Turn to God. He, didn't, he doesn't say pick up your phone, and he doesn't say text your best friend. He doesn't say go on ask Google or you, uh, Yahoo Answers. He doesn't say uh, the, the tweet the question and ask for a knowledge and understand. Asking and looking for worldly wisdom. He says turn and look towards God. Christian congregation, I'm asking you, do you turn and ask God if you like understanding and knowledge? Do you turn to one who knows all things, who's, who's omnipotent, who's all-powerful, immutable, who knows all things? Do you turn and ask God? 
when the fire is held to our feet and we're going through the valley of the shadow of death and we know that the trials are working to our perfection to make us more into the image of Christ, to sand down the plasticness of our pride until the old rugged cross is seen in our life. When we go through these things and we're not understanding and we have this twisted idea that we sin and God is getting even with us. See, let, let's be honest, congregation. There's some who are watching, and I've even been guilty of it, when trials come my way, when struggles are going through my way, when I'm treading through the swamp of depression or, or I'm, I'm fighting the debt on my back and I, and I believe that God is mad at me because of some sin that I've been dealing with and I believe God is angry at me and he's getting even. Oh, Kevin. Oh, you didn't tithe yesterday, so I'm getting you back. Ugh. Kevin, you, you yelled at your kids or you said a cuss word. Oh, I'm going to make you have a flat tire on the way to work. When we go through trials and tribulation, we almost think we deserve it. And like God is getting even with us. That he's not pleased with our good works and it's not enough to get us to heaven. Well, we need to have understanding is what James says. And we need to understand God's word. See, it's easy to deceive people whenever they don't know their Bible. It's easy to swindle people when they're biblically illiterate. When we open our Bibles and see what God says, and we have an understanding, we seek wisdom, and we look at it from, from our point of view and say, God, I'm looking outside myself because I'm weak and feeble. I can't save myself, God, so I turn and look to you. I, I look w without, without me, w without me looking towards a hope my end all and end all is not within myself, but it's in you, God. I, I turn toward you looking for wisdom, and God is not in heaven with his arms crossed and said, Oh, you finally crawled to me, holding back with a grudge, saying, Oh, you should have came to me sooner. I could have helped you sooner. No, no, no. This verse says, If any likes wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach. He's not doing it with a, uh, a frown upon his face. He, he's not looking at your skin color and saying, well, you're white, so I'm just going to give you a little bit of wisdom, or you're black, or you're, you're pecan colored, or you're, you're a Puerto Rican, Mexican, you, uh, you're from Australia, uh, you're a Russian. Now, I'm not going to give you, oh, you have Irish roots. Oh, he says he gives without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting. Many times we read the book of James and it's, it's like James is an outdoorsman. Over 40 times James, he uses illustrations from outside that the average Jew or Gentile would understand. And many times we, we lose that because of our culture, because we're all inside under fluorescent lights. But with a little understanding and wisdom and looking to God to open up his word and open our minds and our hearts, we'll have understanding as James James goes on in verse 6, Let him ask in faith without doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that's driven and tossed by the wind. Have you ever been out in sea? Maybe you haven't, but if you're in a little dinghy or a little boat and you're in the middle of the ocean, you have no anchor. Oh, and you're tossed to and fro. You have no anchor. You, you maybe are throwing your anchor on some, um, some, some, something that looks like it's solid and you're just thrown to and fro by the waves, almost playing batten mitting with you. Or you're trying to grasp the wind using your sails, but the, the wind just whips you around. You're unstable. This is what James is, James is saying, that we are doubting. We're asking in faith if we're doubting. We're being tossed around. Our footing is not sure. Maybe you're wondering if God's able to provide. Maybe you're wondering if God's grace is enough for today. Oh, it was enough yesterday, but is God going to be faithful to his word tomorrow? Is it enough for today? Is God going to keep me in the palm of his hand like his word says? Is, is, is he never going to forsake me? Is he going to keep me close? Can I trust God on his word? Can he be trusted? Is he faithful? This is like... The illustration that James gives us. Like he uses the sea as it rolls into the beach. It rolls over and we see the beach and the, we're standing in the beach and the water hits us and we feel the refreshing of the water but then the water recedes and goes back. 
Many of us believe God is that way, that sometimes he can be trusted and sometimes he sends a flood of blessings our way, but other times we're standing in drought, standing in dry places, and we're like a jekyll and a hide. One minute we're one way and another minute we're another. We're unstable. This is what James tells us about. We're like the men at sea who is believing God is there one minute, then he recedes another. Then we believe that trials come our way, that God is mad at us, and then blessings come our way, then God must be pleased with our performance. We believe that God is basing our Christianity on what we do and how we speak and how we believe and how hard we pray. We believe that our performance, and we believe that the law is what dictates our, our salvation. Well, let me bust your bulb and almost well, make your head spin for the mature Christian. Our salvation is based on the law. It's the law that Jesus kept. Our salvation is based on performance. It's the performance that Jesus kept. We're saved not because we're good. We're saved not because of our skin color. We're, 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 we're saved not because of the, we said a little prayer at prayer meeting and our heads were bowed and every eye was closed and we raised our hand. But that's not why we're saved. We're saved because Jesus died in our place. Those who were wicked and rebellious and religious, Jesus died for people like me, people who were religious, who believed that they can earn their way to heaven, people who were rebellious, people like me, who shake their fist at God and is angry at God. Jesus died for sinners like me. And now I don't have to go about doubting. If God was to freely give his son in my place, and then think about it, Boneyard, how many of you will give your children in the place of a child molester who was condemned? How many of you give your children in the place of a liar? How many will give up your innocent baby in the place of a, 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 a whoremonger, a whore, a pimp, a prostitute, a, a drug dealer, a liar, a thief, a, a, an idol worshiper, a, a pagan, someone who's just wicked to the core, someone who's rotten, who's wretched? How many would give up your innocent child to be condemned for someone like that? Jesus, Jesus died for sinners. Oh, he was good and perfect and holy and righteous, never sinning, never coveting, never lying, never blaspheming God's name, never worshiping something other than the one true God. He loved God with all his heart, mind, soul, and strength, and he died for people who did not love God. He died for people who were on the highway of hell fighting for the best seat. He died for pagans and liars and thieves, people who were self-worshippers, people who die, people who love and kill, who, people who love themselves and kill so they can have their own comfort, people who get abortions, people who give abortions. Jesus died for sinners, and if he did that for us, why can't we trust him with our lives? If Jesus died to redeem us, to save us and give us a right standing with God. Why aren't we sure-footed? Why don't we plant our heels on the hills of Calvary and say, He was faithful to save me. Oh, and now He's faithful to keep me. Why are we torn? Why do we look and say, well, where's God? I don't understand. Is He, is he going to be faithful to me? Does He see me in my situation? We need to seek wisdom and know that our trials Know that our, our struggles, know that whatever comes our way goes across God's desk. That everything that we deal with, whether it's sickness, that it was tailor-made for us, that whatever was strife and famine, nakedness and sword, whatever goes and comes into our lives, it was directly given to us by God. It was tailor-made to make us into the image of Christ, make us more like Jesus because He gave His Son and now he gives us trials and tribulations. I heard old Puritan say, if we look at our neighbor and we see our neighbor and they, they go through life and it's so easy. Oh, they just fall backwards into money and prosperity. Oh, when they go through life and it's easy and we look at ourselves and we struggle. Oh, we go through issues and we have to deal with arthritis or cancer or a sickness. And we wonder if God is fair. We wonder if God is righteous and good. 
And we wonder, and why can't God just be fair all across the board? Oh, Boneyard, let me beckon you and cry to you that we don't want God to be fair. Oh, if we got all what we deserved, we would all end up in hell. But we look up at God and say, Oh, you give my neighbor such good prosperity and me such struggle. The old Puritans say, Maybe your heart has more dross on it. To find the purity of your heart, the beating of the hammer of God must be seen. Oh, is it true? Oh, yes it is that our hearts have much dross, much filth and dirt that needs to be beaten off by the hardships of life. Oh, it would be such a dishonor if God were to just leave us in our comforts and cuddle closely with our sins. Oh, that we keep our sins close and we love them. Oh, let the hammer of God crush us and beat us and mold us into the image of Christ. But we wonder if God is faithful. Oh, we wonder if God is even there. James beckons and he extols us in our hearts to look towards God and ask for wisdom, for maturity. And whenever we go through our fiery furnaces and our valleys of the shadow of death, whenever evil is beckoning at our door, that it's for our good. If we remember what, Ro what Romans says, that all things work towards good for those who love Christ. So don't, don't waste your sickness. Don't waste your depression. Oh, don't waste your sadness. Don't waste your joylessness. Look to Jesus and know that God has placed those things in your life, those thorns in the flesh. Oh, those achy backs and those hard days that God has made you aware of your weaknesses, that God has sent affliction your way that you'll lean upon grace. Oh, that you'll fall backwards in the arms of mercy and remember that your ultimate salvation is not found within yourself, but outside yourself as you lean upon grace, that Jesus holds you in the palm of his hands. This is what James is saying. Ask for wisdom and don't doubt. Oh, stand true on his promises. Don't be at the ocean's edge and say, is he going to be faithful when the next wave hit me? Will he keep me short-footed when the wave hits me? Oh, will he refresh me when the wave hits me? Oh, that we can be sure and stand on the promises of God. This is what James is teaching us. This is what James is saying. Beckon to God. Look for understanding and wisdom. Oh, you won't find wisdom in this world, but you'll find it at its source. The source of all wisdom is God. And the source and embodiment, the, the very flesh and bone of wisdom is found in Jesus. As we read Proverbs chapter 8, that wisdom danced and wisdom sang at the creation of all the world. That Jesus is the embodiment of wisdom. No, it's not Dr. Phil. No, it's not self-reliance. Oh, these preachers who say, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Have you ever tried to pull yourself up by bootstraps? That doesn't even make any sense. How illogical is that? Oh, this preacher doesn't say, look to yourself. He doesn't say, look into the mirror and say, I am somebody. No, this preacher says, look to Christ. Look to Jesus. Look outside yourself to something better for your salvation. Oh, don't look to a bottle. Oh, don't look to a pill to, for your salvation. Don't look to your spouse or don't look to a future spouse. Look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. Look to Jesus, the ultimate wisdom. James continues, says, don't doubt You'll be like one who is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. Or you'll basically be a kite in a hurricane, whipped, slammed, and beaten, and crushed by the wisdom of chasing this world. Oh, Christian, hear the becking cry of this boneyard preacher. Turn your eyes upon Christ. Trust in Him and stand sure-footed on His promises and His words that He's able to keep you. He's able to sustain you. He's able to hold you. Oh, Oh, Christ is mighty. His arm is not too short to hold you. His mind is not too weak to understand and fathom your weaknesses. Oh, Jesus is able. Let us continue as James says in verse 7, for the person, for that person who doubts, the person who's driven like the sea, the person who must not suppose he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Notice James doesn't say that he's unstable in his prayer life. Oh, this goes beyond our spirituality. 
when we're unstable and we don't believe and trust Christ on his words. We don't believe Jesus is a strong Savior. We, we start becoming legalist. We become moralist. We believe that the imperatives of getting to heaven is based on our performance. We, we don't believe that Jesus is able to save us, so we try to keep ourselves saved. You know what I mean. Whenever we raise our hand or we go to the altar and we dedicate our lives to Christ and we accept Jesus into our heart and all that jazz and we leave church and we say, well, I'm a Christian now. I have to keep myself saved. God is in heaven with a notebook saying, all right, he's mine. Let's see how he does. No, no, no. As we read James, we can become a Pharisee as we see all these things that we must do or we become enraptured with grace as we see all the things we can't do and all the requirements when we ask God and we doubt and we wonder if God is mad at us over our doubt when we're commanded to, to tame our tongue when we're commanded to show true religion by taking care of orphans and widows when we're told to do good works and we don't we believe that God is in heaven angry at us but for those, for those who, who know that we can't keep the law of God, we can't keep the rules and regulations and the imperatives, that God, what he calls us to do, always provides the way. When we can't be holy and righteous, he provides someone who is holy and righteous. When he calls us to be good and to honor the Sabbath day, and we don't, he provides someone who is good and honors the Sabbath day. When we have idols in our lives and he calls us not to have idols, he provides someone who does not have idols when he calls us not to be envious or jealous. And we can't be envious, not envious and not jealous. He provides someone who is not envious and not jealous. You see what I'm saying, Boneyard? These are imperatives and we can't keep them. So we fall backwards into the arms of grace knowing that Jesus is our substitute that Jesus is the one that God is pleased with that Jesus has done our performance for God and now he's pleased that he's he's satisfied the becking call of, of the, re, the revenge that God's against his assault on his holiness that Jesus replaced us that he took our place on the cross and now we can rest in grace knowing that we're not judged by our performance, by what we do, but what Jesus did. Oh, we can trust in what he done, and we can trust in what he's going to do. Has he ever lived to intercede for us on our behalf, that we can stand short-footed on the, 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 the Mount of Calvary, that our heels are dug in, trusting in the promises of Christ and what he done for us, that we're not Jekyll and Hyde, they're not a double-souled man, that one living in the world who's trying to make his own way to heaven and one who's trusting in Christ, that we're not unstable, that we trust in him. He's a double-minded double -minded man, unstable in all his ways. He's unstable in his marriage. He's unstable at the marketplace. He's unstable in his business transactions. He's unstable in his tithing. He's unstable in his Bible study. He's unstable in all his ways. He's a jekyll and a hyde. Maybe you see him every Sunday at church. He, one minute you look like he's a powerful teacher or preacher. Or maybe one minute he's a, he's, a, he's a deacon or an elder. He's the guy beside you in the pew. Or he's the woman in the Sunday school. Or he's just someone in your youth group. He's a jekyll and a hyde. Maybe it's you because certainly it has been me. I've been unstable because I had not stood on the promises of God and I didn't believe what he said. Oh, I know how to insult many people. You go up to them and say, what's your name? And they say, oh, my name's Frankie or my name's Tommy or Timmy or Wes. And you ask them, what's your name? And they tell you their name and you say, I don't believe you. Oh, I don't believe you. You're going to have to prove it. Well, they might be a little offended, but they'll pull out their ID and show you that that's their name. And still, you call them a, a liar to the face. And you don't believe them. Oh, that would greatly insult them. But we insult God when we read his word in print. 
His promises to us. We read that he will never leave us or forsake us. That we won't be tossed to and fro. That he'll leave the 99 to find that one. That he'll walk with us. He'll keep us until the end of the age. We read it and then we don't believe it. We look up at God and say, I, 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 I got to believe you. I got to let the, let the gospel resonate into my marriage. But I don't think the gospel has a place in my marriage. I don't believe the gospel has a, a place in filling out my taxes or the marketplace. I don't believe that the gospel has a place within my, my business affairs. I don't believe that the gospel has a place in the raising of my children. Oh, you're a jekyll and a hide. Oh, you transform once you walk outside the church doors. You don't believe the gospel and you're unstable in all your ways. You're a double-souled person. You have two souls, one that belongs to the world and the one that belongs to God and rest assured assured Christian that God will not share you with the world we see here that James explains you're double minded unstable in all your ways unsure footed slipping on ice falling around not believing if, it, if God is able to keep you oh Christian don't be that way trust Christ lean upon his words Oh, he doesn't beckon his followers to take up the sword. He doesn't tell us to go fly airplanes in the towers to prove our love for him. He doesn't tell us to behead our enemies. He doesn't command us to do great works and accolades. All he says is, believe in me. Believe in what he's done. Believe in what he's done on our behalf. Oh, if you read James, it should scream and hollow trust in Christ. Trust in his grace and his mercy. Trust in what he's done for his believers. Oh, he died for sinners who are rebellious. People who are shaking their fist up at God. Running, sprinting towards hell. Loving their idols. Oh, dishonoring the Sabbath day. Coveting, lying, envious, murderous people. Jesus died for those. Oh, he died for the religious. Those who believe that Jesus just saved them a little bit. And now they have to work out their faith with fear and trembling through works and prosperity and pleasing God. Knowing now that Jesus is only pleased with those who believe and trust in him and his final done work that is finished at Calvary. So repent of your sins and trust in Jesus. He is the only way to get to heaven.